Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and as you can see, I have a number of guests tonight. Uh, this will be a panel discussion on refined, or as it's sometimes called, celestial perception. And the reason I wanted to do this is that, first of all, if you read the spiritual literature of various traditions or look at the, the art, the iconography, you, s you see plenty of references or depictions, references to or depictions of uh, stuff that people don't ordinarily perceive in with their gross sensory capabilities. You, know, you see halos, auras, angels, all this stuff. Th those traditions are rife with that kind of thing. And so that's, and so, you know, the question is, what's going on? What is all that? If it's so common in the spiritual tr literature, uh, is it important? Uh, is it something that people can expect to begin experiencing as, they're, as they evolve spiritually? And indeed, uh, I often get emails from people. I got one just this week from a, wo a woman in Australia who, uh, I actually have some notes on it here. She uh, walked into her three-year-old daughter's bedroom and had an unexpected kundalini awakening three years ago. She wasn't really into this stuff at all. Uh, the experience started with a deep gravitational pull to meditate. She wasn't a meditator. And then she saw a red line go straight up through her spine and out the center of her eyebrows. And then she opened her eyes and Sri Ananda Maima was sitting opposite me and took me through a series of initiations. Um, and this kind of thing isn't uncommon. And she goes on to talk about she's always in the company of two beings who are pretty much always visible and uh, all kinds of things. She even wrote a bunch of questions that I might ask some of our guests later. <clears throat> now, the non-dual community, of which many of whose members I've interviewed on this show, hasn't really paid much attention to this. In fact, they would, most of them would probably consider this topic a distraction. Um, the New Age community pay, has been paying a lot of attention to it for some decades, and everybody's channeling Saint Germain and you know whatnot. But there's there's often a lot of woo-woo associated with that. And I think perhaps the non-dual community has been wise to eschew that whole orientation and just try to cut to the, to the quick, you know, cut to the, to the core of reality. There was, of course, one of the greatest uh, founders of the contemporary non-dual scene was Ramana Maharshi. And when Papaji first went to see him, H.W.L. Punja, Papaji, he told him that he was a Christian devotee and that he often played with Krishna. Krishna would appear to him and he would play with him. And Ramana Maharshi said, is he here now? And Papaji said, no. And, pa and Ramana Maharshi said, well, <clears throat> that which comes and goes isn't real. Uh, and you know, you have to find that which doesn't come and go. So speaking of Krishna, in, in the Gita, Krishna says, uh, the unreal has no being, the real never ceases to be. The final truth about them both has been known by the seers of ultimate reality. So <clears throat> if that which is ultimately real never ceases to be, should we be interested in things which come and go? Um, are they valid points of attention for a spiritual aspirant? So those are some of the questions I want to just raise to set this up. And some other questions we'll probably discuss in this talk are um, you know, what this subtle or refined perception actually is, whether it's relevant to spiritual awakening, as I just suggested, whether it is an inevitable development on the path or a special aptitude like musical or athletic ability. Um, the nature of our relationships with the beings which reside on subtler levels of creation. Are we, do we have a relationship? Do we support each other in some way? <clears throat> and whether subtle perception should be intentionally cultivated or whether it will develop on it, its own if and when it is meant to. And if it can be developed, what are the prerequisites to and stages of its development? Another point I just want to throw in before introducing the guests is that I have a feeling just from everything I've been exposed to, that we're not talking about sort of one simple thing which can be put into a, a cubbyhole, that there is a vast range of, we could say, 
subtler layers of creation and all sorts of different experiences are possible at, depending upon what range one is open to. One other point I want to make. Uh, many people in this room and many people watching this will have been students of Mah Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. And he made the point very clearly and in a number of beautiful lectures that self-realization is not the end of the line. And in a, in a sense, it's a foundation or a prerequisite to uh, much more profound levels of development or experience. Um, and he went on to talk about refined perception at great length and associated that with culturing of the heart, expansion of love. So I think we'll be talking about that too tonight. So let me introduce our guests. Uh, I'm going to introduce them very briefly, and if they want to introduce themselves at greater length, they can do so when they each speak. So I'll do Stuart, starting with my left. Uh, oh, I, one more thing I want to say, and that is that everybody on this panel has been reluctant to participate and to, <laughs> <laughs> and to actually Not come as out reluctant, <laughs> <especially> <laughs> uh, to, uh, to come out and talk about this stuff. Because I think partly it's rather intimate. It's it's very it's a for, so very gentle, intimate, private kind of experience. It's not something you go shouting from the rooftops. Um, and also, I, I think it has to do perhaps a little bit with cultural norms. If we all lived in a society in which everybody perceived this sort of thing routinely, it'd be no big deal. I mean, you know, what'd you have for lunch? Uh, you know, it'd, be, it'd be like that. <laughs> you know, oh, I saw a celestial being today, big deal. Let's go, you know, shopping. Uh, but it's not, it's unusual. It's, it's, and even to speak of a spiritual awakening, what to say of any sort of subtle perceptions, many people get flack from their friends, you know, who can't relate to Joe Schmo having, you know, being enlightened. It just doesn't, they know the guy. It doesn't seem like he's enlightened. So there, there's a little blowback, I think, that a lot of people experience when they come out with this stuff. And very often when they experience that, they stop talking about it. So it was just sort of a little bit like herding cats to get everybody to come on this panel. <laughs> All right, now I'm ready to introduce them. So to my left, um, <coughs> Rufina Farouk Akhlazaria. She and her late husband, Farouk, uh, have been teaching meditation in the St. Louis area for a long time to people who would otherwise go to jail or who are on probation. Uh, there are some judges down there who sentenced them to learn meditation <laughs> instead. That's right. <laughs> so that's great. And uh, as I say, each person will be able to introduce themselves at greater length. Uh, and Rafina is the only person on this panel whom I haven't yet interviewed. I'll be interviewing her in August. Uh, to her left, Francis Dale Bennett. Uh, Francis is a, for the better part of 30 years, was a Trappist and Benedictine monk uh, in various monasteries in the US, Canada, and France. Um, he and I are good friends, and if I interview many, many more times, I'm going to have to change the name of the show to Francis. If <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> to his left, Harry Alto. Harry is a professional artist and businessman here in Fairfield, Iowa. And after I interviewed him, uh, a couple of months ago, um, he started getting flooded with emails and speaking requests and so on and so forth. And you know, people were emailing me saying, cancel everybody else, just interview Harry every week. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a very popular guest on the show. Uh, to his left, Kristen Kirk. Kristen is a healer and spiritual teacher who lives in the Northampton, Massachusetts area. Her interview was on that gap was also very popular. Um, and I'll let her introduce herself at greater length when she speaks. And to her left, Stan Kens. And <coughs> Stan, I'll just read part of a little bio he gave me here. Since his immortal nature was revealed to him in 1994, Stan reports being established in lively self-referral awareness. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at Marshall University of Management here in Fairfield, Iowa, doing research on a topic that relates to what we're going to be talking about tonight. And he was, I believe, the Oh, here's some. Since his early childhood, Stan's experiences and interactions with celestial and light beings continues to expand in, in both regularity and meaning. And Stan was, I believe, the third person I interviewed on that. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, so thank you all for doing this. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how this is going to unfold. I think we'll have discussion among ourselves here for a while, and then maybe after an hour or so, we'll open it up to audience questions and discussion, and we'll just kind of let it roll. 
So do, do any of you, I shouldn't put anybody on the spot, but do, do any of you have an inclination to go ahead and speak first? And I'd like each of you, if you would, to just describe, you know, your own experience in relationship to this topic and your kind of understanding of the topic relevant to your own experience. And, you know, we'll, we'll keep each one a little brief because if we each go on for 15 minutes, that'll be the whole night. So, you know, let's just kind of go from one person to the next and who'd like to go first. Well, I can start, Rick, if that's okay with you sure. in the panel. Um, my experience has started when I was a very young person, probably, I was thinking back today, maybe about eight or nine years old. I used to go to summer camp and it was a Christian summer camp and we were out in the woods with an open chapel and I can remember being very bored with the service but I used to watch sort of like um, shadow or angelic beings fly back and forth from one side of the, of, of, of the adornments of the altar um, and I entertained myself with that for quite some time and then as life progressed and I grew older I had episodes and they didn't last for my whole life and I don't always have them now but I had celestial hearing for quite a few incidences, um, saw other types of beings, and I went through an evolution as my own nervous system and my own consciousness expanded, those beings took different forms. Sometimes uh, at, at one stage of my life, the uh, plant kingdom sort of spoke to me very, very lively. Uh, later than that, I had interactions with beings that my, uh, and my senses interpreted as animals. I had a spiritual experience with a possum and the animal came out of the woods and rested its head on my foot and it actually terrified me because I was sitting there hoping to interact with nature on a very deep level but when it actually <laughs> happens there are some parts of your mind and thinking and ego and it's just not something that we're used to doing in our culture so you have reactions that you don't anticipate for yourself and then I developed the ability to see auras at a very uh, early time in my 20s continued around um, <coughs> many, many years doing auric workshops and teaching people how to regain auric sight in color and the meaningfulness. I continued on then to um, work in other areas of, of development and dream time, lucid dreaming. Um, and then as time goes on, I would have experiences. And one of the most vivid was there was a being that um, emerged from a tree while I was on a vision quest. And I was just sitting there quietly in the woods with no clothes on, in, in, you know, merging with nature. And I saw this, what looked to me like um, a puffball mushroom start to grow out of the side of a tree. And I had a biology degree at the time, so I was kind of intrigued that this <coughs> thing could grow so fast. And over, over a two hour period, it grew about that big. And then a stem came out and then it started to rotate. And when it turned towards me, it had a face on it. And uh, that was when I really wished I could pass out intentionally. <laughs> 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 and, and it sort of progressed from there. And what I understand is that the nervous system and all the different levels of psychology have to integrate, or at least they, that's the way I interpret it. And so <coughs> sometimes a being will take a form that doesn't just shock you to pieces, because who knows what it could really be. It could be a light being or something that we can't even cognize. But over the years, as I've expanded my possibilities and gotten more used to it, they seem to be more directly interacting now, maybe just as a light being directly. And so um, that's my story of how the evolution transpired in, in, in my life. Yeah. Okay. Who'd like to go next? Well, let's go from, I don't want to just go from right to left. But um, do you want to go next, Kristen? Yeah, can you remind me of the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, just to talk about, um, your own experience with this topic of subtle perception or refined perception. Um, when and how did it dawn and what, you know, was the nature of the experience? And is, and how is it continuing to, to develop? You know, five minutes. Um, I guess it's easiest for me just to speak about what's, what's kind of present now. Um, there's been a just sort of a falling away of what was my normal used to be the normal kind of reality um, and I'm experiencing everything as conscious so um, yeah whether it's the chair I'm sitting in you know the the walls the um, the trees the rocks the wind you know I mean like everything everything I just experience as as consciousness and that there's um, I was sharing on, a, on Friday um, 
that at some point I realized that the Disney movies were more real, <laughs> depicted reality more clearly than most of us understand, you know, where they have the teapots dancing and talking to each other, and, and um, that that's more actually how I'm experiencing uh, consciousness. And then in terms of all the different, different dimensions that um, are also part of my experience of reality, that there's communication just throughout, there, there's not, nothing is being withheld. It's only my experiences, it's the, the, our perspective that, that limits that, that access. Um, and so for me, but before I had that, the reality kind of shift in um, 2003, I had what people would call more like psychic perception. And then as things shifted, um, what do I want to say? Um, What's different is there, there's, there's not a separateness. So that before there was a self having psychic experience, looking and exploring, and after the shift there was an interest in reaching out and exploring. There's just a resting and then reality continued to, to open itself. And then I would just say briefly that just what comes to mind, the, the value that for me is that communication with all these different beings um, is profoundly supportive and has supported my spiritual evolution, continues to, and deepens my love, my compassion, my understanding, my presence, um, my ability to share. And in the sharing, it's not like it's happening at something that I'm doing. There's a whole... Uh, there's a whole configuration of beings that all come in to support whatever is happening, whether it's a talk or a healing. So there's there's no separation. It's it's um, so that one, you know one value, and then a, then another is just the awareness of what an exquisite place we're living. Like I think people miss that so often. People are reaching for some spiritual transcendence and getting to get away from physicality and there's no there's no difference like this is in my language this is like divine existence that's happening and um, so it's not at all I mean it can be a distraction if one uses it that way but in my experience in the embodiment of this realization life just gets richer and deeper and more exquisite and separation just continues to fall away and fall away and fall away and deepens relationships, respect, caring, caring for the planet, caring for each other. Good. So. Okay. Who would like to go next? Everything she said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do... Um, my experience has also started at a young age, but I won't go into that. Um, but I will say that subtle areas of experience are just as permanent as, as gross or non-changing areas. The whole field of consciousness is uh, it's a continuum. Um, the subtle areas of creation are there all the time. What's missing is the ability to see them or be them. Seeing is believing, right? So in the transcending process, I could turn the whole thing upside down and say that the most beautiful, most sublime area of consciousness is, is this relative that we live in, this so-called changing area. Now, th this, this uh, physical reality is connected to the divine levels of consciousness. And divine levels of consciousness are uh, connected to the fundamental level of human consciousness, that abstraction, that the light, the, uh, the knowledge that exists at the fundamental level of human consciousness. That area of consciousness percolates into the divine level. The divine level percolates into the uh, so-called gross level. But I don't like calling it a gross level because, like you both were saying, the divine level is just as immortal as any other level. The gross relative level is, is fundamentally where all the benefits are going to be enjoyed. The divine levels of consciousness have a function in the same way that your fundamental level of consciousness has a function. Let's say the laws of nature, or the asp all these aspects of nature, fire, air, water, uh, space, and so forth, 
all these elements of nature are administrated by uh, the personifications, let's call them, or the, uh, the gods of nature, right? These gods, these devas, they, they're constantly active in relation to us. They're doing their thing. If you have bliss, if you have knowledge, it's coming from somewhere. It's not, it's not, it's not, doesn't not have a source. It has a source, and the source is the uh, subtle level of your own consciousness, and everybody's consciousness has this. The only thing that might be missing is the ability to see, hear, taste, and touch these levels. Now, the subtle levels of consciousness are constantly open to me. They've always been open. They've been open for 30 years. And I don't always go there, but it's always there. I can feel it right now, right? And it's not so much that there's beings there. It's more like you're there. Consciousness is there. Your wholeness is there. Your love is there. Your, your feelings are there. Your knowledge is there. All of it is, a, is kind of like an exquisite continuum. It's like a huge, it's, it's a cosmic hierarchy of sublimity or whatever it is. It's wonderful. And, and I'm not the guy to talk about, you know, love and all that. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit, usually I'm very shy about these things, but, but human consciousness can tap into anything it wants to, anything you want to. And it's so natural, so just there, so immediate, so now, it's not the subtle levels of consciousness aren't out there somewhere in the heavens. They occupy the same space, the same physiology, the same consciousness. You know, and our bodies sit here, but you know, our bodies are also cosmic in nature. It's not just our minds that are cosmic in nature. The whole show is cosmic. And it depends on you where your attention is, your abilities are. But it's so natural, it's just seeing is believing. That's enough for me. <laughs> no, you first, ladies first. <laughs> OK. About 20 years ago, a friend whom I met for the first time, he's a meditator, a Maharshi Transcendental Meditation meditator, told me that he had an experience with someone on Purusha, another meditator. Um, Purusha is just a monastic program in the TM movement. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, he said that they were meditating together once, and when they opened their eyes, they were in a different place, and in a different time, and, and they, everything around them looked different. And <coughs> since then, it had completely changed his life, and that that experience that he had he was able to transfer it to others also. So I got immediately very interested, being a teacher of Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation myself since 1978. Um, I was very intrigued. So this was about, like I said, about 20 years ago. And I immediately asked him, I'm going to be the next one. I want to get that experience. I want to know what it is. So. The same evening, because he was leaving the next day, the same evening, we sat together, and I had the most transformative experience of my life, which I'm telling you all about for the first time. This is, I have been very shy about this, and I have gone through a lot in my life, in the last two years especially. So many things have changed in my life. I've become a widow. I got very sick. Many big changes in my life. And I thought that this is the time of my life that I want to give back what God has given me so much of. And this experience was a transformation that began a whole new world that I'm going to spend a few more minutes, perhaps than my colleagues, to explain to you what this life has been like and how it can benefit you in some more detail. So I sat with my friend like on that sofa and I'm here, probably a little closer. And he looked into my eyes and he just told me to just look into his eyes, which I did. And I started to feel the ethers around me change. I could actually see like the wall started to shake and everything around me became very ethereal. They, 
took on a different property than what we could see around us usually. So I was just easy with the experience and I continued. I'm used to transcending. With my eyes open, I kept looking. Suddenly, in addition to this, a huge globe of light came out of his third eye. And then more of it came out and it filled the room. The whole room now was stealing into brilliant, golden, celestial light. I was in for this. So I was, you know, <laughs> I was enjoying it. And um, I thought this was it. You know, there were no words being exchanged. So the, the, everything was filled with golden light that was emanating from his third eye. Then my third eye also was pulsating greatly. And um, light started to come out of my third eye also. And I could see all of this happening. And more than that, the room was transformed into the most beautiful celestial place you had ever seen. If you watched a movie like by Cecil B. D. Mills or any of these guys from long ago, it's as if you opened a jewel box and everything in the room that you had seen previously to be gross became made of golden light of different densities. Suddenly, everything became so heavenly. I felt I was in a different place already, but that was just the beginning. So first of all, this huge jewel box opened up, and this jewel box was everything around me already, except I could see it in pure golden light in different densities of it. Then, as I looked at my friend, he started to change. <laughs> he didn't look like the person that I started out with either. His face started to change like, the mask fell away, and immediately I saw who he was previously in his last incarnation. And I knew who he was to me. And I felt it and saw it, and I knew that he was seeing me also in my past. Just as he was seeing and I was seeing. I saw where we were. We were in China. Then I saw we were in India. Then we were in Europe. And then the masks of all his past fell away. I saw hundreds of lifetimes that we had lived together in 3D clarity. He was not, no, I could still speak. I don't know how, but I was able to speak. He could still speak too. And we were softly having some minor conversation, but it was really mind blowing. Um, I saw all the lives that we had lived and they were Numerous, they were now going like flicking by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I was seeing the whole stretch of all the lives we had lived together. And I was feeling at the same time in my heart all that he had been to me during that time. And um, at the same time, there was such silence. It, the silence is, was so palpable. It's like nothing you normally would experience, even while transcending. So that was, that was it. So that was my shaking up experience, my transformative experience, my first time tasting the celestial gold. After that, I wanted to keep this experience. And I noticed that golden light was flowing out of me uh, readily, uh, and do, doing different things speaking on the phone or whatever, doing anything, the golden light would become apparent. And if I sat with it and I looked into the eyes of someone else, I noticed the transformation could take place again. I could see the world made of celestial golden light, the sight of which created such bliss. I could feel my heart bursting. I could feel bliss pouring out of my heart. The silence that you would expect in the transcendent became lively in the relative. I could feel so much silence even while the world was transforming at the same time. <coughs> so I continued to do this like an advanced technique. I was used to meditating already regularly, twice a day. And um, I just tried every day to enliven this celestial level with someone with someone else. And um, 
it grew, the experience grew with me over the years. And I began to see, you all here cannot believe how beautiful the world is, just as it is right now. If only you could see it. And it breaks the boundaries in your heart when you can see how beautiful everything is. It's all interwoven. The ability to perceive, to feel the bliss, to feel the silence, and to enliven all of it together. It's like the whole wave of the ocean rising up at the same time. So this was happening. And I realized I could see people's past lives also. So I decided to experiment. I asked one or two of my relatives to sit with me for me to look at them. I had the most marvelous show of my life. <laughs> I saw who these people have been to me in all the previous incarnations. I saw, for example, my sister-in-law, who is willing to speak to you also. <laughs> um, I saw that she and I were burnt at the stake together in medieval times for witchcraft. That's one of the things. I saw in one of her lives that she was my mother and she was, we didn't have a good relationship and it made her cry when she saw it with me again. Remember, we were not exchanging any words. This is all communicated simultaneously. So these are just some of the experiences. So I did this with a couple of people and was able to peel back through sight only the information that is stored with us at all times. I don't have to do anything. Even as I was speaking to Francis outside just now for the first time, I could already see the mask of his face peeling back. Um, <laughs> uh, so after doing this a couple of times, I decided, wow, this is really something. Let me try this now on something that might be really useful besides me getting all excited about it. <laughs> and I had a friend who had just lost his wife, and he was grieving greatly, a young man. I was young also. Um, and I asked him to sit with me and let me go into gold, which is what I call it. I go into the gold because I go into the golden light and everything becomes that. And he got great relief from his grief when I was finished with him after a couple of minutes. I said, wow, this is beyond my control now. I better check with my master. I, I communicated to Maharshi what was happening to me. And I got the message back from him that I was very beautiful. Maharshi said, sign of increasing purity. Use the experience to bless the world. Forget about the past lives. <laughs> so, by that time, after you've seen many past lives and you've realized you've been all things to all people, you have lost, the, it loses its charm. So I was kind of relieved with that kind of information because after you've tried every candy in the store, it doesn't make any difference. We've been beggar, king, queen, everything. One thing I'd like to say though is that when you change sex from one life to the next, first life you change your sex from the previous one, you probably will end up being gay or lesbian. It gives you great compassion when you know this, that the, if you've been a woman or a man for a long time, and it's your first incarnation or so, when you're making the change, it happens spontaneously. Have compassion on the gay homosexual community. It's natural. It's the change of the energies. Okay, because I know I've taken a lot of time, I must get you to the present. So since that time, I kept it quiet, and I would just sit and go into golden light, permeating everything, and just enjoying the growth and the bliss that took place. In the beginning, I froze like a statue, as I have read in Ananda Moima's books also. Uh, I would just look into your eyes. Let's say I was looking there, I would just sit and look. And my body would freeze completely. And the golden light would pour out of me and enliven in the whole room. Now if there's somebody else in the house, as I had, they always knew when I was in my golden experience because it would change the environment. They could feel the difference. And so that continued as the years went by. I just knew I had this ability. 
and I kept it to myself basically until I realized let's try this again after so many years I did it with a brother who has retained the ability so whoever I do it with gets the same ability that's the thing your phone's gonna ring the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the when I when the Shakti when the Shakti from me goes into your eye it enlivens the same experience in you and you can retain it and have the ability my daughter here has the ability uh, five years ago she had always expressed an interest in um, in what I was doing and I told her at some point she would get it but uh, my husband was a bit afraid about these past lives and all these things we didn't want to expose it but one particular day I felt it very strong right then and there she was sitting in front of me and I said Annie look at me and Annie looked at me and I just zapped her <laughs> and what was very beautiful for me is that um, she described to me what I was experiencing I felt like crying because this was an innocent child with no experience or theoretical information about anything she told me mommy I'm seeing the light waves coming out of your forehead, moving like this, coming out of you. That's precisely what I was seeing. And from then, she got the ability also. Now, this has had tremendous effects, as you would imagine. But right now, in the present time, I have found that doing any activity, the celestial light comes. I could be watching TV. I could be very sick. I have to tell you, what's happening to my body is not what's happening to my celestial perception. Uh, I was in the emergency room, couldn't even speak because I was in so much pain, and I was filling the room with golden light at the same time. It's very visible. I can see the light pouring out of me, and if you have perception at that level, you can see it too. But recently, what really kicked me out of my seat to call Rick is that um, I was lecturing as a, as a TM instructor. I was speaking to someone. And while I was speaking to them, I looked into their eyes, and the whole room turned into gold. And she saw the whole thing. And she was kind of like totally flabbergasted because the whole room filled with light and changed in front of her eyes. So I thought to myself, Maybe I should do something about this. Because it seems like once given the right start, people's third eyes can easily and naturally be opened and gives them celestial perception. In my viewpoint, oh, I should tell you, in the beginning, I used to see celestial golden beings as well. I would, I would be going to check someone's meditation, and two golden people would come and sit next to them. Or I'd see a little golden boy walking around the house. Uh, golden beings were also in the room. I do not have that perception at this time. Other things have taken its place. I seem to be able to light up a room literally. And I seem to be able to transfer the capability fairly easily as well. Um, so that is my experience in a nutshell. I'm sorry, the nut was a bit big. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I have to tell you that this has broken the boundaries of my heart in a big way. That bliss flowing through me, that light that emerges from me, has really made me a much more loving being. I think the people around me should be the ones to speak about this. It is not right that I should speak about this. But I think the boundaries of my heart just fell away as bliss flowed through me all these years. And I think higher states of consciousness is nothing like I expected. I thought it would be a sterile place of non-activity. It is not that. If I am there, it is a place of great joyfulness, happiness, love, full of God. I love God. I'm a total devotee of the Lord. I have also divine manifestations 
which I cannot speak about in this lecture. The lecture doesn't leave room for that, and I will leave something for August interview as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, my world is so much richer. It is not the passive, cold place that I expected an enlightened world to be. It is so much more beautiful. I care so much more for people. I feel sometimes like the whole world is living in my heart. And I could feel everyone inside of my heart. I feel sometimes like the gardener in front of me is so dear to me, as dear as the guy who's putting on my roof, as dear as my sister, as my child. I feel them in my own heart so much. I could do anything for them. I, I feel my, it's nothing like I had anticipated. And I'm very glad it isn't. That's my Thank you. Thank you. Brother Francis. Oh, my. <laughs> Tough act to follow, huh? Yeah. All of them are. Um, <clears throat> um, normally, when I give a talk or something, I kind of have a little sense of what I'm going to say. Not always. And this is one of those not always times. Um, so I'll just open my mouth and see what comes out. Um, I would have to say that the, the essence of what I realized in 2010 when I had a kind of major shift, um, in my own words, the way I would describe it if I had to put it in a nutshell, was that I suddenly saw so clearly that God is in everything and everything is in God. <laughs> That, that the reality of God that I'd been seeking my whole life as a monk had always, always been present. It had never not been present. And everywhere I looked, I saw God's presence in all these various different forms. And um, I always loved God my whole life. But that set in my heart a fire burning of love for God that was very intense. And um, this week, I thought of a, an example that, that would relate to this. And that was an example that I think a lot of people could relate to. If you were in love with someone, if you had, if, if you're a man, whatever you like, men or women, it doesn't matter. If you were in love with someone, when you're looking into the face of your beloved, you would notice every little detail. You know, you might look into the eyes of, of, of a woman you love, and you might notice the little flecks in her eyes. You might notice her eyelashes. You might notice the freckles across her nose. You might notice the way she wrinkles her nose when she gets angry. You might notice all kinds of little details. And the reason your perception of that person is so refined and so precise is because you love them with all your heart. And my sense is that when love for God sets your heart on fire, your perception just automatically, love refines it. Love itself refines it. And as Harry said, uh, I think beautifully, the idea that um, this, this phenomenal world we live in is not just an illusion that can just be dismissed as nothing and be, a, you know, just let it go to hell in a handbasket, you could say, because it's not real anyway. All that's real is the absolute reality. It's more a matter of seeing the absolute reality in all these forms, of seeing the presence of God in everything that exists. So uh, I thought when Rufina was talking, I thought of this image of the Wizard of Oz, you know, that scene where Dorothy's house lands in Oz, and when she first opens the door, and everybody kind of goes, ah. Oh. You know, she opens the door, and from this kind of drab black and white world, she opens the door, and there's this magical world of color and vibrancy and life and love. And I think when a person awakens to this presence of God, that, that I would call awakening to the presence of God, it's like that. The, the world takes on a whole different look. You know, um, Jesus said, uh, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst, or the kingdom of heaven is within you. It can be translated either way. 
And I think what Harry said is really accurate, that there are all these various dimensions of reality, the phenomenal relative reality. And they're not in some faraway heaven somewhere. They're all around us. They're within us. They're, you know, that there are so many layers of dimensions of reality, of phenomenal reality, that are manifestations of God, that are, in a certain sense, an incarnation of God. And, and the eyes of love, when they're awakened, the eyes of the heart see that. And that not only includes this physical world that we live in, that we're, most of us are conscious of on some level, and the divinity of that world, but it includes other worlds that we're normally not aware of. And uh, I think that's sort of, for me, that's the essence of this. It's looking at phenomenal reality with the eyes of love, with the eyes of God, you could say. God looking at God in all these forms. And there are many forms that most human beings are not aware of. And um, at some point after that awakening, I started becoming aware of, of various other dimensions. And, um, you know, they're, they're very real. They exist. There's a movie out now called Heaven is for Real. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the message of that movie, it's a beautiful movie, by the way. <laughs> Get a chance to see it. It's about an innocent little boy who, who gets a, a look at these celestial realms. And they're not in some far off place. They're right here with us, all around us, and within us. And I guess that's what I'd have as an opener. <laughs> and maybe that's all I have. <laughs> um, rather than me ask questions, I'd, I'd like to have the you know, panelists continue to uh, interact as if, if some of the rest of you have responses to what um, anybody else has said. I, I do actually. Yeah. I, I've just, I haven't ever spoken with Harry, and after watching part of the interview, I totally wanted to have a conversation. Well, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> here we are. Put this up. <laughs> I, I think, um, so this is more just, yeah, and it's just what I wanted to share that, that I haven't heard a whole lot of people speak about the Davic reality, the way that I experience it. And what you were sharing came the closest to what my experience is, is that in that of everything being conscious, like that the Davic world is this other part. So we have our human, the, uh, our manifestation of consciousness is only happening because it's completely interwoven with this Davic reality, which is also conscious, but it's a different. And it's not just beings, it's everything. Yes, yes. That's what I liked what you said. Yeah. Everything, the chairs, the floor. Ev right, everything. Everything, everything. Right. everything is conscious. Right. Yes. So when I go into a room to, to have a, a talk, I mean, I, I, I I'm, I'm in harmony and communication with the walls and the rugs and everything of coming into alignment to create today, you know, whatever it is that's happening. And there's a, um, so I don't know, I just wanted to say like, I'm, it was, um, it was thrilling <laughs> for me, you know, to hear, to hear someone Thank speaking in, in that way that I just, people don't usually talk about. Um, there's so a, that's there's a state of consciousness called unity consciousness, and your speech or your talk reminds me of that. Everything mm -hmm. in terms of the self, everything in terms of uh, knowingness, uh, uh, the shining inner life is outside as well. There's no outside, right. there's no inside, right? right? There's right. no outside, no inside. It's, all, right. it's one continuum. And I love the, when you talked about the um, golden light, right? And, you know, I, I think of that as Soma, of course. And everybody knows, or mostly knows, what soma is. Soma is, is also related to soma ved, which is the one of the principal veds in the ved. And it's the movement of consciousness. And I experience that movement of consciousness in this in a similar way you describe, but more like a like a rain shower that's constantly. Uh, moving as golden light into my heart, out of my heart, into my head, out of my head, everywhere, the whole body from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head has this uh, golden quality to it in the movement of, the, of this pure white primordial consciousness. It takes this golden hue when it becomes more conscious and more form-like and the, this golden light, uh, this movement of consciousness shimmers into or solidifies into the devas of creation. And of course, 
you might see the Indian devas, other people see Christian devas or gods, but they all have the same, they're all united in their efforts to bestow and communicate and be there for us all of the time, right? That's what you experience. That's, That's what you say. Totally my experience. We're, yeah. At least we're all in agreement, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Rick, I'd like to share. Lots of people hear these stories and they wonder, like, how come this panel of people out of so many people are having these experiences? And so my research for the past six or seven years was to try to understand a deeper level of, you know, how does a human being evolve to that level or or change to that level. And so I think I'm the first person to actually do some validation that you can, by putting our own awareness, each individual, into the boundless field of the transcendent several times a day, at least twice for some time, that the field itself cultivates you. You don't really have to work at it at all. And what we saw when I did my research was we have a community here where people have been doing that for 40 years. And so many of them reported not only just these celestial visions and hearings and so forth, but the spontaneous and instantaneous fulfillment of their desire. You have a thought of something, and somebody may run into your house and give it to you. I mean, it can be just that spontaneous. And so what happens is that the human being is, this, is an expression of a unique expression, each of us, and what are there, close to seven billion on Earth now, we're all a unique expression of this boundless intelligence that takes every form that we've ever seen or could imagine, and we can reconnect with it at such a deep level that we have the experience of the wholeness of it. All the memory of it, all the beauty of it, all the gold of it, all the visions of it, and we're one with it in such an intimate way that anything it wants or we want as a representative in physical form of it is just instantly given to ourselves. And it's an exquisite thing. And it's actually, you know, my research validated that, yes, this does happen when we do these kind of practices. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all yeah. else should be added unto thee. Yeah. And everybody, every place can have that experience. Life becomes effortless and no mistakes ever. You make a decision, it supports the evolution of every single thing that's part of the wholeness. No more mistakes with nuclear energy or anything like that. It's just effortless, correct management. It's really quite beautiful. <coughs> um, audience, Is anybody in the audience um, would like to ask anything? If, uh, if you'd like to sit in this chair, be on camera if you don't mind, come up and sit in this chair. And also we don't want big long gaps while we're passing the mic around. So. Maybe it's, people should be coming up here, and if you don't want to be on camera, just kind of wave the camera guy away, and he won't put it on you. <laughs> but uh, think about it. If you, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, uh, yeah, you go ahead for while they're thinking about their questions. While you're coming up. Oh, you've got that. <laughs> I'd just like to say that one of the experiences that blew me away in the beginning was I went to a Gandharva Veda concert music. Mm -hmm. And I was able to see the shapes of light generated by each instrument. It was kind of, it was really a, a, a neat experience, you know, that I could see the shapes of light coming off of each instrument. Then another thing, I was working at the Embassy of Japan in Trinidad. And I remember I went into my boss's office once, and when I looked at him, he looked like he was a mannequin to me. And I thought to myself, I, I thought, and then I realized what was happening. My consciousness was shifting between Rufina, the small individual, and the unbounded standpoint, which was the bigger me. And this is what was happening. When I shifted into my big self, everybody, including me, looked like mannequins. I, we looked unreal against the backdrop of my real, big, unbounded native. And this happens also when I look at someone and the transference is taking place. I start off looking at you. I'm Rufina and you are. I'm looking at you. And then my boundaries start to fall away. And I feel myself become that unbounded, expanded self, which is not contained in the form of Rufina anymore. And that experience, 
um, I would shift in and out of it <coughs> during the day, during the night, while I'm sleeping. I would be in my, I would be sleeping sometimes, and I would think to myself, "Who's in the room with me? My husband is not here. Who is this? I'm hearing this person? I check. It's always me. <laughs> I'm snoring. <laughs> you know, or I'm breathing deeply, or." Something is happening in the room, but that big self has taken over. And I'm not relating to the small Rufina boundary until I shift back into it. So the awareness, I could see there is value in bringing out that whole unbounded self into the boundary. And it gives me the qualities of that level of that unbounded feel, even while being in the relative. So all the beautiful qualities you expect of that absolute feel become very lively in my, be in my little body. So that's why sometimes I feel as if I'm going into a spiritual ecstasy. Actually, I do. I feel so much bliss, so much love for God, for everyone, for everything that is flowing through me. I feel as if I have to pour it on everyone. I have to give this love back out. And that's why I'm, I have taken this step today. Because I have to give all this light, all this love back out as much as possible before I lay this body down. And that has been my motivation. Um, one of the th questions this woman from Australia asked the, the, whom I s referred to earlier in, in the beginning, Stan reminded me of this because you're talking about you know how heavenly the world could be and we won't make mistakes and all that stuff, but obviously that's a far cry from the way the world is now. So and Harry was talking about how everything that's on the surface of life is percolating up from subtler levels. So how about all the yucky stuff? Is is it just that there's not enough of the good <coughs> stuff percolating up, or are are there sort of is there some kind of battle between the gods and the demons going on on some subtle level? And um, here's, here's one of her, her things. She said, when the Kundalini awoke, it was shown as a red line entering and going up the spine. And as it entered the heart, a being emerged, quite a freaky looking thing that wasn't too happy about being removed. It was clear that it had acted as some kind of block. And as it came out after some time, dissolved through the field. Interesting that these blocks can have energetic form. And then she said, if I sit in meditation with others, I v she very rarely does because she lives in a small town in Australia, I sometimes see beings being released. One time, one really made itself known. It came right up close and wouldn't leave the person it was attached to. If we have these experiences, is there any guidance as to what to do? So, you know, we've all heard the idea of spirit possession and Jesus casting out the you know, the devils out of people and then them getting up and being healed and cured of insanity and so on. So uh, what about this whole thing of sort of subtle energetic forms, actual malevolent intelligences of some kind rooting themselves in our makeup in some way and the whole process of, of purification is, is a matter of purging us, ourselves, of those forms. Does anybody have any comments on that? I do, Rick, I, if I can talk again. Mm -hmm. um, what, I've, what I've come to realize is that eventually the awareness gets to a certain level where it realizes absolutely without question that everything is the self and wholeness. And when that happens, the individual turns its own awareness or her own awareness back into the self and cleanses the entire way that they think or manage or deal with anything in, in their experience. And that cleansing process actually ripples through their whole environment. Their environment actually gets joy-filled, effortless to manage, and, and it's a, it's a self-referral loop. You know, the Mayans had the snake swallowing its own tail, and it's like the intellect grabs on to, oh, this is all just me, and then suddenly it becomes wholeness, and that wholeness starts to cleanse itself. It doesn't need to have any other techniques. When we see things as something else is happening, that's still a little bit of mm, residual uh, smoke in the, in, in, the, in the thinking of the wholeness. But when the wholeness starts to realize that's only thing here is me, and what I allow to come through me is what's going to be my experience, then it self-cleanses, and it becomes joyful. 
Anybody else have comments on that? It's, um, <coughs> it's an interesting subject because despite this joyful, knowledge-filled experience that can be had and is had by awakened people, the body continues to age, the wars continue in the world. Uh, why is that? Why, why don't we? Uh, because there's laws of nature, right? What we get the ability to do is focus in the right way, everything in terms of the self. Now, we still have, you're, you're not going to get rid of wrinkles or losing your hair or any of those kind of things. What, what the awakened state accomplishes is that the mind is constantly in this blissful state. When it gets more dramatic, when it gets more obvious, when it gets more prevalent, the awakened state overshadows everything. But overshadowing doesn't make, the, it takes the badness out of the bad, but all that continues to happen. You don't look quite the same you did 10 years ago, and neither do I. Why is that? There, there's kind of a balance in nature, right? There's certain laws of nature that make things end. There's certain laws of nature that make things evolve. There's certain things, laws of nature that you might say are bad, but the awakened mind doesn't recognize the badness in the process of aging or the process, any process. It all becomes a positive kind of uh, phenomenon, and, and it's hard to describe. But, you know, and there are devas and there are the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're there. And, and they, they have their game. But an awake mind can look at this area and, and put the whole show into it, as it were, and just see the bliss, see the knowledge, see the joy. And it's, but it's quiet. It's not always overt. You know, you can see me scowling, walking down the street, but inside I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something, you know, something manifesting the scowl as well. But I'm just not paying attention to it. You might be, but I'm not. <laughs> okay, go. Francis or Kristen? I'm trying to keep it back. Yeah, you things. should say something on this uh, <laughs> sin stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Exorcism. <laughs> Kristen? <laughs> um, for me, this is a huge, it's a huge topic. Um, and to do it justice would need a long, Another a show. long, yeah, a long time, you know, amount of time. Um, so my hesitation, and I, I will speak about it briefly, my hesitation in speaking about it briefly is that it's really valuable to get the whole scope because people have so many questions about it and there can be a lot of fear about it and people having their own experiences internally not understanding what's happening that's, that can be terrifying. So, um, so I just want to just say that, that to, um, just to, I don't know, I don't know if you're nowhere. Let me just be quiet for a second and see if I'll toss it back to Francis. <laughs> um, so, so my experience is, yes, there's a whole game. There's a whole, I mean, I love how you speak about the forces, right? The, the universe is an amazing, amazing game that's at play. And that in the internal realization of wholeness, there's not the fear, there's not the being caught up in the game, and that the deeper recognition of love and compassion is then what relates with what may look like a demon or may look like a past life trauma or may look like an abusive parent. So that those things are still happening and at play, and that when I'm doing healing sessions with people or working in large groups, um, a lot of that more condensed, uh, contracted, those contracted states of consciousness are what come forward. And my sense is we're just at a time in evolution of the planet where the vibrations are shifting so dramatically that people are waking up all over the place and these densities are then being brought to the light 
because the vibrations are, are raising. So um, I would just say that in my experience, a lot of the stuff that people are frightened about or have questions about, that there's a certain level of reality to it so that people aren't crazy and that getting support can be really helpful and um, is sometimes necessary. It's been necessary in my path. Um, and at the same time, in the deeper truth and wholeness, everything is, everything is good, everything is divine, and everything is in harmony, even if it doesn't feel like it's harmony. From a deeper perspective, there's a harmony and a wisdom and a learning and an evolu evolution that's unfolding. Francis, you want to say anything, or are you kind of sitting there? And not, not at the moment. Okay, you just pipe up if anything comes to mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so I've always had that question, and I think this is my opportunity. I've been uh, thinking of the higher states of consciousness, like all of us, as we learn them, starting with transcendental consciousness, uh, cosmic consciousness, divine consciousness, unity consciousness. And uh, this is such a clear progression. And uh, as I become more and more familiar with it, whichever way I am, I'm thinking, well, uh, it sounds like there is a, an overlap between these different states of consciousness, and it is not like um, going step by step. So uh, I would like to uh, find out from our panel <laughs> whether you experience uh, this blending of different states of consciousness um, in different ways. So, so the... Uh I think both are true. It's certainly in my life, not that I'm saying that I'm in these states, but let's just imagine for a moment that I've gone through, for instance, Maharishi's state, seven states of consciousness, GCC, GC, UC. Cosmic consciousness, God consciousness, unity consciousness. Yes, those are the distinct levels that the TM organization talks about all the time. And I've experienced all those states of consciousness, but they've come very distinctly and very overlappingly, both. Come and go, come and go, come and go, and then there, then another one starts, and then it, but it never stops. It doesn't, you don't get CC witnessing of sleep, and that's the end, I am enlightened. Then you get GC, celestial perception, and that's the end. What you realize with every state of consciousness, as it unfolds, it becomes part of your life. Your past life doesn't, disappear, your future life doesn't disappear at all, amalgamates into the state that you're in at the moment, and new and more unity consciousness dawns, everything's in terms of the self, hey, wonderful, hey, boom, next day you have another experience, it doesn't look like unity, it looks like something else, much bigger, much better. I, I totally and it keeps going. agree with that. Goes on and on and on, and then Maharishi calls it Brahman consciousness, right? And guess what? Brahman consciousness is takes in all the relative, the gross relative, the pains and the stresses and the, and the loves and the demons and the gods, everything starts amalgamating into this consciousness, in term, not in terms of the self, in terms of wholeness now, something much bigger than the self, if you can say that. Maybe you can. In any case, so all those states of consciousness, they totally overlap, everybody can have them, and the biggest real, realization you have in every state of consciousness is when you're there, you've always had it. Always had it. Never wasn't there. That's how simple it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is one of the things that struck me when I first started to have these experiences. As a teacher, I had been teaching about growth to cosmic consciousness, rise to God consciousness, and then to unity consciousness. So in my mind, I thought it was a linear kind of thing, progression that would take place. I thought that after you've been having witnessing at night, then you would start seeing refined perception, and then you would have some unity experience. So you're kind of waiting for it to happen in that way, but it, it, it's not like that. It's just as he described it. I find that you seem to have sometimes some CC experience of witnessing, of the unbounded, getting big, and then you're into celestial perception, and then the world has suddenly become so much a part of you, it's, it feels like it's unity. And then you're back in CC again with, you know, it's really an interweaving of the different states of consciousness. I think Maharshi, just like he described with the bubble diagram, 
he laid it out so that we could understand it intellectually. But when we experience it, it's really all interwoven. I think it's mm. a very good point, Francis. Let me quickly explain something for the YouTube audience, um, because a lot of these acronyms and terms might be unfamiliar. Um, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who some of us on this panel have a background with, um, laid out seven states of consciousness. And waking, dreaming, and sleeping are the first three. Everybody experiences those. The fourth is actually, had the Sanskrit name for it is Turiya, which means fourth. And uh, that would be transcendental consciousness, pure consciousness, pure awareness, without any relative experience. Repeated experiences of that through you know, integrating it over time would result in having that fourth state become permanent in the midst of the other three, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So, you know, in the waking state, it would be experienced as a state of pure silence or witnessing, feeling a detached feeling that you're not the actor performing the action that's going on by itself during sleep. There'd be inner awareness, even though you're snoring like a sailor, you'd be awake inside. Maybe that's something Francis can speak to because that's his experience. He snores like a sailor. No, he doesn't. <laughs> like it's not. He stayed with me at the sand. You know I don't see. I know you know. He's teasing. In fact, he said when you when you had your foot surgery and you went under anesthesia, you lost that inner awareness, uh, and you, it was quite surprising. Ordinarily, it's there during sleep. Then uh, I'll just wrap this up real quick. But I just want to throw this out for because we're banding about these terms. Uh, Living in that state for some time, this, the senses would refine, and instead of perceiving the ordinary gross level of uh, creation through the senses as we always have, uh, appreciation, love would grow. We'd be pre perceiving much finer levels of, of the objects we perceive, much closer to the value of the absolute, although not quite there. And that Maharishi called God consciousness, and that's what they mean with GC when they say it. And then eventually, uh, the subtlest value would be uh, uh, pr apprehended or appreciated, and the objects of the senses would be perceived in terms of the self, in terms of the absolute that one had known oneself to be since it was first tasted in, in the fourth state and stabilized in the fifth state, cosmic consciousness. But as these people have been saying, it's not quite so sequential as that, not quite so linear. They appear to be all much more mixed up, and you know, one thing can precede the other. And so these, uh, the unfoldment of states of consciousness do not eliminate previous states of consciousness, mm. ever. Here mm. we are. We still have bodies. We walk around the street. We don't walk into trees. We don't lose our, you know, we don't lose our sense of direction. We don't lose anything. What we do is gain something. Each mm. state of consciousness is a wonderful gain. It's an addition. Mm. Every state of reality, every state of Clarity is an addition to what we already have. It's not often um, the growth of consciousness is thought in terms of elimination. Yes. Go go towards this nothing state. It's wonderful, but it's nothing. Well, okay. You yeah. know, okay. I, I've got nothing. I I can experience nothing, sort of. You know, and I can talk about it. There's this ground state. There's nothing seems to be there, but all this other stuff is there too including the gross relative. It's one big, massive continuum of uh, consciousness. That's all it is. And I like your way of describing it as golden light, because that's very integral to the phenomenon of the movement of that consciousness, of that silent consciousness. But all the gurus, or many gurus, and many advaitis, and what do they call them, non-dualists, I'm, I'm all for them because they've realized, if they've truly realized it, a state of consciousness of this incredible uh, ground state of awareness from where everything starts. But I'd say that's the first step, not the last step. I really liked what he said. Uh, I think that's really an important point, that, that the expansion, you could say, of consciousness, it's not really that consciousness is expanding, obviously. But our awareness of it is expanding constantly. And when it expands to a, a larger space, it doesn't eliminate the boundary that it had before. It includes it and expands it. And it, it, it just keeps including more and more and more. And my sense, you know, I mean, you were talking about a kind of a particular map of consciousness, which is the, uh, from the TM teaching of Maharishi. And that's a perfectly valid map, I'm sure. I don't happen to know a lot about that map. I mean, I've heard little descriptions of various states that I can recognize kind of in my own experience. 
But, you know, and in the Christian mystical tradition, there's a map of consciousness that is laid out by St. John of the Cross in the ascent to Mount Carmel and so on. He talks about three major states of consciousness, purgative, illuminative, and unitive. And there's probably corollaries. If you took the map of consciousness that Maharishi sets forth and you compared it to the map of consciousness that John of the Cross sets forth, I just read a, a book that Rick passed on to me about Kundalini, and I could see precise parallels between the map of consciousness of John of the Cross in the ascent to Mount Carmel and the map of consciousness that this woman was basing on, on classical kind of uh, uh, teachings on Kundalini arisings. And I could even see in my own life parallels, like I could look over 25 years of my life and see, oh yeah, that, I, I remember that and that. You know, and it was so fascinating to me that you have these two maps that, are, that, are, that sound very different, but they're really different ways of describing the same journey. And um, I think a lot of stuff in, in, in the kind of non-dual spiritual scene, a lot of people um, have a kind of awakening, a, a glimpse, whether it's, it's it, sometimes it's kind of an intellectual awakening to the understanding of non-duality, and they get stuck there. They get focused on that, and they think that the realization of that kind of larger space obliterates what came before. And it's a common, common, I think problem in, in this scene, and I, I think what Harry I said. I don't think it's a problem, though. I think it's it's the first step. Well, you know what it I mean? can be. They, it can, they won't stay there forever. So. Yeah, <laughs> it can be a problem though when they think that yes. that that the journey's finished and that That's right. okay, That's I've right. had a glimpse of the absolute. I'm done. Yeah. I even ran across people recently who were using that term that so and so is done, and and my my response to that was. They can't be done because no one's ever done. It's like the, you know, this, um, like you were talking about these different states, these different um, stages of consciousness, and each one of them is infinite. Like you know, each each one of them has an infinite depth that can never be plumbed. In 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 a, in a human lifetime, certainly it can never be. So, I don't know, I just, it's, I loved what you be, said. Well, it's beautiful, you know, <laughs> this is a kind of a simple analogy, but it's kind of like if you're walking in a landscape, you have the foreground, the middle ground, and the horizon, and as you're approaching the horizon, the horizon keeps moving. Yeah, exactly. That's what consciousness is like. Yeah. The horizon gets bigger and bigger, not smaller and smaller. And right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. I'm glad you're saying this stuff, and um, because I obviously talk to a lot of people in this field, and... Uh, I think people can get stuck, and they can get stuck for a decade, decades. Lifetimes, oh, probably. Yeah. <laughs> they're actually in an awakened state, but they're stuck for the rest of their life, perhaps, in that state. And I don't want to name names, but they, you know, they, they keep saying the same thing over and over. And you know, many people in that boat would listen to this conversation and think, what are these people talking about? They're crazy. They're, they're overcomplicating what is really such a basic, fundamental thing. They're just l layering all kinds of stuff on there about golden light and beings and all these things. That's all illusory. It's all Maya. Just you know, s settle down into the, into the self and be done with all that. And <coughs> experientially, I have no authority to speak about this, I don't think. But, <coughs> intellectually just from everything I've learned and, and to whatever extent I've experienced it and you know some of the great beings that I've had the uh, privilege of associating with I just feel like there's such a vast range of possibilities and Marshy once said you know he someone asked him about getting stuck in this state they were talking about this sort of flat absolute plain vanilla he said it was like a bullet going through his heart to hear that because he knew that there was so much more that people could experience and he, he just really had this ardent desire to unfold the whole range of possibilities for people. Mm. I'm ending, ending up talking a lot more than I thought. <laughs> you can tell me to shut up if I talk too much. But you know, I'd like to comment on, you know, I, I took my first interview with Rick uh, two months ago, something like that. And and I've had, I don't know, 600 responses, you know, and I've answered 100 of them. And what really got me is that, you know, sometimes we're in this community here, TM community, right? Hey, we're the only ones that have pure coins. We're the only ones that have these states of good. But what I'm hearing and seeing is dozens of people having these same experiences. They've never done TM. Yeah. They're having these experiences. They're having unity consciousness experiences. 
like you. And many people like that. And some of these experiences, and the way they describe it is phenomenal. And they ask me questions, and you know, I'm saying, whoa, where did these guys come from? They should come here to this community. But all I'm pointing out is that this is a very universal phenomenon, this growth of consciousness. Yeah. And this, the clarity of consciousness exists throughout the whole world. Yeah, this woman from Australia, um, her brother, who is a plumber in this little town, she, she, now he's awakening. The, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. he, he doesn't know any of this stuff. I mean, it hasn't been, hasn't been of interest to him, but the, he's right. cooking. Yeah. So the, it's, it's exciting. It's, it offers hope for the world that, you know, right. people are popping all over. In my experience was that every single thought we have can shift our state of consciousness. Every single thought. And... and uh, those of us who do advanced practices become aware of those thoughts and we can be very, very subtle in what we allow to go through our awareness or not. So to me, that's one very profound thing. The other thing is, when Harry said, you know, these things are all here, they may only be here because we still recognize them to be here. We may have, as, as some masters have said, the ability to fly, the ability to rejuvenate, the ability to live as long as we choose to live. And if we keep accepting that they're always going to be here, maybe they're always going to be here. But if we allow ourselves to entertain the possibility that we're divine and anything we can imagine and hold our awareness on is possible, maybe they won't be here either. That's where I'm coming from. <laughs> is it on? Okay, I, I have a, a question and a comment. And the comment is, I have never heard anybody else describe that experience that I had too. I was on a bus, I turned around, every seat was filled by a mannequin. It was actually a little scary. You know, I mean, really, literally, a mannequin, and I knew literally, I knew they were people, but I was seeing mannequins. Whew. So thank you for mentioning that, because I, uh, I never heard anybody else say it. I didn't know what I was having. You know. It really looked like that to me. Alex. Yeah. You see the movement of the limbs and everything. They look so unreal. Yes. They look to me, this is a mannequin speaking to me. Yes. And in, in truth and in fact, that's when your big self takes over and you are not seeing it only from your small perception. That's when I, I, I began to realize that my awareness was shifting in and out of the small Rufina seeing and the bigger side of me that was cognizing things in their true perspective. And we put a lot of emphasis on the mannequin that we see and that we feel we are until we realize that there's a lot more happening as well, you know. It's, it's really grand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you Thank for you. saying that. Thank you for saying that. I've never heard anybody say it. And I didn't know what, was, what I was having. And, and then the question is, are you going to be around for a while? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this thing that, you know, everybody wants to... Okay, let me give you a little sure. interesting tidbit. Yes. I mentioned to Rick. No, I'm not going to be around for a while. But I'd like to just mention, just as a point of interest, is that there are certain times when this energy is very lively in the environment. And all of us who have it permanently um, can tell you that when it's full moon, you can go celestial like really, really, really quickly. Mm. I was saying maybe I should start giving some full moon retreats, you know, mm. because it happens so quickly. It's so spontaneous. It, it actually happens quite easily with me now also, but um, I don't know what to do with it. Mm. It has happened, like I said, I was just talking, I'm just talking to people and boom, it's happened, you know. But I don't know what more to do with it, except maybe to have a retreat and see if somebody wants to try it. I don't know, maybe it happens in groups too. I've never spoken about this in public before. Neither has Francis. Uh, this is a new this thing. This topic, other things. This, like this particular topic of, of <laughs> the time perception. And I, I know the transference for me is very real and very easily done as well. But at the same time, I, I don't know what made it so. Maybe there are other factors that I'm not aware of, but everyone I have done it with, it has happened. And my daughter is here and she has amazing perception as well and she sees more she sees celestial beings and so on she is 15 and she started when she was 10 and she had previous experiences too and i don't know where this is leading to that's all i can see well you're coming back to fairfield on august 3rd for a bat gap interview maybe you should do a retreat that weekend and
Is it for moon? I don't know. It's <laughs> for <laughs> your benefit. You could do one down in St. Louis too. People could go there. Yeah, maybe I maybe I will have a, a full moon retreat. Who knows? Why not? Yeah. If you're open to it, why not? Yeah. Because I, I see there is value in bringing out your big self. Obviously, that's what it's all about. And I see through this <coughs> Shakti part, which is direct transference, it enlivens in you, and you get the ability to bring out that complete silence while your eyes are open. That's a big deal. It, it integrates the growth of the transcendent, the finest relative after that, becomes very lively in your awareness, and the world just becomes so much richer. It's so much more beautiful. And unity and all these other states of consciousness, they are not flat and sterile and horrible. I don't know why I thought so, but they are not. They are full of love and compassion and richness. and It's, it's just more. It's just more and more and more. It's not less, less and, and less. less. <laughs> You're right about that. It's beautiful. Maybe if you all inquire, and I, I get some serious interest, I might think of doing something. Is there a way to connect with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll be putting this interview up and it'll link to her website as it does to, as it will to everyone else's websites. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about celestial perception or refined perception. I, I suppose there are levels of perception which you would call refined, but you were not, not yet celestial. You know, there must be many gradations of it. But uh, a, a question I want to come back to is the relevance of this to, to spiritual awakening. Is is what we're talking about here something that everybody on the spiritual path sooner or later is eventually going to experience? Uh, you can't get stuck anywhere forever. Maybe they're not going to experience in, in this lifetime, in this body, but is, is kind of facility and familiarity with the, the, the finer realms of creation, the celestial realms, an inevitable um, uh, unfoldment in the course of everyone's evolution, or is it some kind of a um, kind of an option, like you know, a special aptitude, like musical ability, as I said in the beginning? What do you guys have to say to that? It's all these states of awareness, the celestial levels, the that from which the celestial levels arise, the and the, and the, our daily lives are all connected. They're all eternal. There's no. You can't take the celestial level out of the, our daily lives any more than you can take the celestial level out of uh, that fundamental oneness of consciousness that exists uh, universally that is there to be tapped into. So it is the awakening process will always involve to a certain degree, depending on which senses are predominant in that person's uh, physiology. Maybe it's the sense of sight. So you, you'll see that more. Maybe you'll hear it. In my case, I have four senses lively in the celestial all the time. And which and one's not lively? Taste? Well, uh, it's the senses. I know, you had four senses, you yeah, said sure lively, so we senses. have five senses, so which no one's not lively? <laughs> Just no, curious. The, the, and all I'm saying... <laughs> These, these states of consciousness aren't something you can dismiss. They're going to, they're going to come into your awareness sooner or later as the clarity awakening is the experience of those states. Now, could one be sort of prematurely interested in this stuff? You know, I mean, if it's not relevant at one's, whatever one's stage of development is, can it be some kind of mind candy that could actually be a distraction and it will become relevant later on? But one should just not even think about it. At this I don't think you should go after just the celestial levels. I think you should have an integrated approach. You get techniques from the masters who know how to give them to you. You go through this process of refinement of the nervous system. You go through this process of refinement of the senses. You do advanced techniques, and these things unfold. After they've unfolded some of these states of consciousness, they'll start revealing themselves to you, and they won't overpower you, and you won't turn into some kind of zombie or something. <laughs> yeah, overpower is an interesting word. Yeah. I remember uh, first course I was ever on with Marushi, he was talking about God consciousness, and he said, you really need the foundation of the self. Uh, and he said, the immensity of God consciousness, if, if when fully experienced, is so great. He said, God couldn't even telephone from a distance if you didn't have the self established. You'd be crushed. You need to establish that. If I didn't have a wife when I went through GC, I'd be dead. 
<laughs> you would have starved to death or what? No, it was overpowering years yeah. and this is years ago. And how did how did Kathy help? She took care of the issues huh. of relative existence. Uh -huh. The, the sights and the sounds and the tastes and the touches were so overpowering, that's really all I could do. I wouldn't know how to write a check. My hand wouldn't move that way. Yeah. Yeah, this woman said, uh, there were seven times when I, was sure the super when I was sure the amount of energy and alchemy occurring would kill me. I've been totally brought to my knees, only to find love there. It's been a gut-wrenching trip, but I'm here to tell the tale. Uh, and I know the fear and pain of real awakening. Uh, my, some traverses are razor thin and my heart goes out to those trying to navigate through. So, but, yeah. but this GC state hasn't got anything to do with pain, I'll tell you no, that. No, no, no. That's more like uh, maybe a CC beginning separation. Even Marishi called it terrible. Right. <laughs> so yeah. maybe that's more like it, but not, not the celestial levels. Kristen, proportionately you haven't been speaking as much. Do you have anything to add at this point? <laughs> She's having a good time. <laughs> Um, I have sat with that question because, you know, we had talked about it before and um, in my experience, I, I don't know, I mean, I m meet people who are deeply, beautif beautifully awake and aren't having all these experiences and I, and I wouldn't, so it's hard for me to say if there's something comes next or if that happens, but um, so I don't know. Oh, go ahead, go. I'm going to say something now. Um, I mean, I, I just tend to speak of my own experience, you know. And on a certain level, it makes sense that the more present people become, and the more surrendered they are, that those um, those containers of the sense of self that are useful in the function of perceiving, that when they start to soften and open, that the perception then is also less limited, becomes greater. So again, expansion isn't necessarily happening, that the focal point of that, that um, vantage point of perception starts to deepen, and so the perception gets broader and broader, and that for me, the senses in the physical are just, uh, not just, but their, their divine function happening for this reality, and those senses are a reflection of a deeper, a, a deeper function, a deeper reality a, um, that, that can continue, they open through all these different um, subtle and subtler levels. So it would, it would make sense to me that, that there could be an evolution of opening to all this subtle perception. So I could see that being true, but I also wouldn't want to put it forward as steps that someone should be reaching for or, you know, I mean, I, I, I always point people back to what's, what's, what's true for you, you know, what's true there, and that some people it may be useful to do techniques to develop that perception because it's in deep alignment with that God consciousness right there, where someone else, it might be completely not useful and a distraction, and I would say, no, don't do that, just go sit, <laughs> just go sit on your pillow, you know, so. My sense, yeah. too, is that <clears throat> um, this journey that we're all on unfolds in its own way and differently for each person, and while I think you could say in a certain sense that that very refined levels of consciousness and perception and so on are inevitably going to unfold for everyone, for every form. We also have to realize that there's this context that's huge of perhaps countless lifetimes, you know? So to say it's going to all unfold in this one human incarnation, I think is not accurate because how can anyone say that? You know, you know it, it, all of us are at different points of the journey. And I, I often use the analogy of if you had a track and a race was being run, and you had somebody starting at the starting line, you had somebody starting 20 yards uh, beyond the starting line, you had somebody st starting 20 yards behind the starting line, and then maybe somebody starting two miles down the road, 
you know, from the starting line. That's the reality, I think, that we have because of karmic, sort of dharmic <laughs> kind of dynamics. We're all at such different points of this journey. And there's no telling, really, the, the precision of that, but how that's going to play out, how that's going to unfold. But I think there can be a kind of innate trust within us that this consciousness that, that we really are, that we can awaken to, that we can come to realize as being who we are on the deepest level, is utterly open and trusting. And, and just allows whatever comes and allows the unfolding of this journey to unfold as it does. And it's going to be different for every form. David, come on up here. You don't have to be on the camera. Today. Kristen, you were talking about surrender and you were talking about devotion. So how does surrender and devotion, what role do they play and how does one uh, develop these things? if one isn't feeling it. In, in my case, I'm all for the technique of Shakti Pat, which is the opening of the eyelid. It just took place like that. Of course, for me, it was on the basis of lots of meditation and advanced techniques and so on also. But it spontaneously developed afterwards. Although I have to give credit to the fact that I am a Catholic, and I've been very devoted in my tradition to Mother Mary, to the church. I attended a Catholic school, a ca all girls convent. And I was very much into the prayerful side of things as well. However, there was a definite shift in my consciousness and in the capacity of my heart to love God and to love his creation when my third eye opened and the bliss started to flow. It, it happened simultaneously. As my third eye opened and I perceived the objects of creation in their celestial value, I could feel the change in my heart taking place. I could feel sweet bliss developing. It's very it's like it's, inter it's an interaction that takes place. And that developed in me outside an activity. Um, more surrender, more love of God, because I was feeling and seeing God in everything flowing and experiencing it at the same time. So surrender, devotion to God, sight of his creation, all of these unfolded, are, are unfolding together. And by opening my perception in that way, it certainly burst open the energy in my heart and in the crown of my head. I was telling Rick, started to feel like I was walking with a fountain on top of my head. I would put my hands many times to see what's on top of there. And when I was meditating, so many years had passed with me having the experience, and still I would open my eyes to see who put on that bright light there, you know. I'm meditating. It's, the bright light is inside all the time. So these things develop. Surrender develops. You can't make yourself surrender. You cannot make yourself love God just as you can't make yourself love the person next to you. You cannot make yourself become devoted. These things unfold naturally as your being unfolds. They are not things you can make happen. The best you can do is do those meditation practices. I personally recommend Maharshi's Transcendental Meditation. And um, do those practices that unfold that level of being in your awareness. If something happens with my Shakti but opening of a zone, that's fine too. <laughs> part, of, part, of, happening. part of my retreat today was about surrender, and it precisely agrees completely with what Rufina just said, which is that surrender is not something you do. It's at the deepest core of your being, that presence, that consciousness, that pure awareness is pure openness. It is surrender. And, and, and the way to get to surrender is not by doing anything particularly, but it's by touching into that reality and realizing it. And that reality is itself like surrender, you could say, the essence of surrender. But a lot of people think of surrender as something you work yourself up to or some emotion you have to create. And, and that, I don't think that's what it is. I think it's, surrender is realization itself. 
you know and when you when you tend toward intend toward that realization you're approaching surrender you're approaching that consciousness that's utterly open and that's that's just what we were talking about today at the retreat I'd like to say something too um, I think where I'm drawn to speak is a, another another aspect of surrender um, part of my process had been um, being with all the the densities that were were coming up and there's identification there so there is a an investment in the emotional story or thought pattern so there was a very visceral engagement with what was coming up you know I mean I think this is what people's lives are about where we're, we're engaged where there's an attachment and that my process was um, was actually the practice of surrendering so that my relationship to surrender was actually a, a very active a very active engaged process and that's what my that's what my whole process was that something would come up and I would feel the pain the the depth the excruciating the hatred the what, whatever these intense these things that were coming up that were coming to the surface and that for me surrender and devotion were then the same thing because if everything is God then this hatred rising up in me is God this terror rising up in me is God and if I truly trust if everything is one then there's a willingness to then surrender into the experience that was coming forward and by complete full meeting of that experience recognizing everything is truth then the contraction, the, the identification with that experience would release the, the um, substance that was created from the attachment that was held in my being would dissolve, the devic beings connected with the supporting that whole creation would then um, also engage in that releasing and that the, the surrender and the devotion were then the same as the love, the love of everything um, and through that process as things continue to resolve then the the radiance the golden truth that is deeper than those contracted thought patterns or emotional holdings would come forward so yeah so I, I th those are the, the same for me I love your question there's another phenomenon that we might just in the remaining time um, just ask you guys about uh, a number of people that I've interviewed um, have, for the most part, spontaneously begun to experience channeling. You know, like Mercedes Kirkle, she was sitting meditating one day and all of a sudden Mary Magdalene started, she, she was convinced it was Mary Magdalene, started coming through and dictating all this stuff which she wrote down. Um, Andre Morgana, um, you know, had gone through the whole TM thing and very well established in, in a nice state and uh, she ended up going to South America and now she she sort of actually takes on the whole persona of Hiawatha and the, and Vovo Alamale who is some kind of South American entity. Um, there are others too. Jetta Mali I interviewed just last week she says she I don't know if it's channeling but she talks to Jesus and Buddha and you know the, these higher beings. So what do we make of this whole channeling thing? Does anyone have any opinion about it? The, the people I spoke to seem very clear and they don't seem like they've been overtaken by some entity. It's, it, does it have, what's the significance in the whole spiritual um, phenomenon that we're, we're seeing in the world today? I can definitely speak to it but I was just speaking so if anyone yeah. else has a... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it makes sense to me in terms of people opening and the vibrations on the planet shifting that some of the veils that were really in place and in tight that were tight are are softening and opening so that people are having access to um, consciousness in all all different forms so I mean I experienced that channeling is different than than awakening in terms of accessing someone else's consciousness and I think there's definitely a value and a, a place for it, but that, I don't know, I was just, I would say. Yeah. Uh, um, 
I had had predictive dreams before the opening of my third eye. In my family, it runs in the family. But I would say that since this phenomenon has taken place with me, I find that I have I've been able to have very clear dreams, which I don't consider dreams, of the different gods. And because I am appreciating gods from all traditions, Hindu, Catholic, Zoroastrian, and so forth. My home is in all of these are there. Um, I have had very deep and real experiences with some of these gods, which of course I would never tell anybody about. I, I don't know why I'm saying it now, but. <laughs> 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 including Christ and um, Lord Vishnu, Lord Rama, and various others over the years. And whenever they came to me, Mahalakshmi, whenever they came to me, I would immediately rise out of my consciousness and know, I knew that they had visited and either blessed me or told me something of significance. Actually, it's, it's really kind of interesting. I just remembered one night I dreamt of Sri Satya Sai Baba. Again, remember, I'm Christian also. My tradition and all my prayers are in such. And uh, he told me in, in, in that state that he was sending me a gift. He was giving a gift to me and my husband. Of course, like most mornings, because my husband knew I had predictive dreams, I would tell him what the day held for us. He would normally get some indication what the day would be like, so he would know whatever it was. I told him, I said, such a Sai Baba came to me, and he said he was sending us a gift. I said, okay. <laughs> it turned out that a friend of ours, who was gravely ill, um, came to visit. She was moving to Hawaii. She wanted to spend her last days there. And she was dispersing with all the things she had with her. She brought me a vial of ash from Sri Jati Sadaba. Mm -hmm. you know. And then she later brought me his pigtail. I was not a specific devotee of Sri Sai Baba, but I love God in all his forms. I think the deities know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was just one connect connecting point of um, my dream and reality, just to, to verify that these de devas do exist on that fine level. And the light that I can see outside also shines inside. And when it shines inside, I get to see the celestial level where Maharshi says the gods reside. He says it clearly. So if other people are experiencing God consciousness and the celestial levels, the gods will appear to them and they will give information. And I imagine channeling would also be possible. I have not had channeling. and. Uh, but I just thought I would share with you that I do have these experiences of Lord Vishnu and so on. And, and now that you said it, I, I, I'm, I'm taken back into the experience over the years, you know. And remember to ask me for it in August, OK? okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was, uh, I was kind of thinking that, that we would make this a marathon. We'd go on for three hours until 10 o'clock or something. But then I learned just today that we have to get out of here ultimately by 9.30, but I'll have to wrap this up by about 9 in order to pack up all the equipment and have everything totally out. So um, I, I, would, I, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, have the people on the panel make some kind of concluding remark. Um, I don't know if Rafina feels she needs to make one in addition to what she just said, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, if everyone could sort of make some sort of concluding remark, that would be great. And then, and then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up, although I'd really like to do this for the next three hours. But. So um, the, you don't have to go in sequential order, but based on everything we've talked about tonight, um, is there anything that, whatever comes to your minds that you'd like to say in conclusion? Well, I started the beginning, so I may just start the end. Um, I think that it's possible for the kind of idea that I would like to leave everybody with is every human being has the possibility of making an entire journey back to wholeness. And when you get there, 
every single thing you desire is possible for you to experience and live with. And you don't have to have the negativity in the world any longer. And I think I'd like to, if I live for anything, I'd like to inspire people to take that path and to go in that direction and to materialize heaven on earth with me. Thank you. And Stan, is there anything that if you would have to offer people individually or in groups, if they were to get in touch with you, would you be giving courses? Would you go in, out in the lecture if somebody I'm invited you? Would the lecture service. Some kind of one-on-one -on -one sort of my, thing? Um, research is unique. It's never been done and it's unprecedented and I think it validates the fact that human beings have the opportunity in one lifetime to culture themselves until they can command the laws of nature. And okay. I think that that's something that is very exciting and I can't wait to share it. Just like Vina, I feel it's my dharma to get out there and, and share it with everybody. Okay, and we'll talk about how I can set it up so people can get in touch Wonderful. with you if they Thank want you to. very much. It was a pleasure to be with you all tonight. Yeah. No words are coming at the moment, so if you're Francis or Harry, popcorn style. <laughs> you know, the consciousness is available. Pure consciousness is available. I think for everybody, just like you were saying, right? And and the full potential of that consciousness is available. But I think many people. Uh, even if they have the experience, maybe tend to minimize it or maybe even depreciate it a little bit. Pure consciousness is very natural, very normal. Everybody has it. The celestial levels are universal, just as universal as pure consciousness. And they can be even not so obvious, let's put it that way. They're so simple, so natural. You can even see stuff and, and discount it. My advice is to, whatever you're experiencing, give it its full value. And that's how the benefits from that experience will come. If you have a transcending experience, don't say that was nothing. Say it was everything. Go for it. Think about it even. Talk about it. That's what Maharishi has recommended we do. I started talking about the experiences five, six years ago, or writing about them. It's, even though I've had these experiences my entire life, just the talking about it, accepting them, knowing them, has tremendously increased the knowledge level, which has increased the joy level, which has increased the ability to get the benefits from it. I don't talk about benefits very much, but they're all there. It sounds like, hey, you should be able to turn that carpet gold, but you can if it has any value. So I do agree with you, I don't disagree. So all I'm advising everybody is to pay attention to experience, accept them for what they are, for their fullness, not for their emptiness, for their, and the benefits that arise out of them can be very subtle, but all experiences that are powerful are subtle and quiet. That's it, folks. <laughs> You're next. You guys don't have to make including oh. remarks if you don't want oh, to. Oh, you want to say something? Yes, not You have something now, Kristen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this whole seeking thing of looking outside oneself um, is, yeah, you can do that forever. <laughs> and that the, the exquisiteness of what's happening is happening all the time right here. And if you go the other direction, you know, into, oh, sorry, I'm banging the microphone, sorry. <laughs> that's, the, that's the heart pounding sound. <laughs> um, you know, going into your own, the, everything is right there inside, so you don't have to go anywhere. So I would just invite that curiosity and um, the invitation to be present with what's really happening right now for you in this moment and that this is an incredible, there's an incredible thing happening right, right here. You know, like just washing your dishes is a profound thing. The water is conscious, the soap is conscious, the dish is conscious, you are conscious, like this whole thing. So I would just invite you to um, open in more presence to, to, the, to what's happening now. Yeah, and that you don't have to go anywhere. Right?
May I sing? Yes, please. I would like to thank you, Rick, for doing such a marvelous job all these years. Just like we are stepping out, at least I'm stepping out for the first time, you're doing something truly amazing by making it possible for shy people like me to step out. It's hard to think of being shy. <laughs> it's, it's the powder melt biscuits. <laughs> um, it's also a, a delight for me to hear other people share some of the experiences that I have had so intimately for such a long time, including my friend who came forward with the mannequin uh, analogy as well. I'm very appreciative. I'd like to say that I don't know if there is going to be any real value in my continuing to speak like this, but I will make myself available. And if it is found to be useful, I will continue to lecture. I have several lectures lined up already, and I, I, this is the first time I'm speaking, but I will be speaking in a couple of locations, Salt Lake City and San Jose and um, Seattle and so forth. But I will continue if it is useful. And I'm happy for the forum. And again, I thank Rick and the organizers for making it possible for us to all come together today and to stir up that pot of consciousness and to bring out some beautiful gems, golden celestial gems that are really silent. You know, Silence is golden, they say. And I think there's a reason for it. I think thank so. you, Rick. <laughs> <coughs> Francis, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> You good? I'm in peace. OK, good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me make a few concluding remarks. Um, most of the people on this panel, we may do the same. We're, we're, I, I've submitted a proposal to do the same thing at the Science and Non-Duality Conference out in San Jose out in uh, s late October. So we'll, we'll be doing a, it'll have to fit into an hour somehow. Mm -hmm. um, all of these people I have interviewed with the exception of Rufina, as I said, but um, I'll be linking to all of their websites on uh, the page that I put up about this interview on batgap.com. Um, you can check out their websites to see what they may have to offer. Um, and I won't go into all the details that I always say at the end of every interview. You know the drill. Um, go to batgap.com, poke around, you'll see all kinds of good stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I guess that's it. Um, thanks for listening or watching. And we'll see you next week.